recently I saw a um, a uh, um, a blog, and this blog had the uh, top ten uh, mixed martial arts fighters of all time, and I can tell you that I disagree with them. Like I disagree with a lot of people who talk about the top ten uh, mixed martial artists. Now, what I'm going to say here um, is going to come across as being arrogant, uh, but I don't, I don't care. Uh, my opinion is the best opinion on social media, and the reason is because I'm I'm using a logical criteria uh, to determine. Who is the greatest mixed martial artist of all time? Okay. Now, I'm going to set up the criteria. I'm going to tell you the criteria. And then I'm going to name the top 10 greatest mixed martial artists of all time. Now, um, before I do that, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am. Now, the reason is because there is a resistance. And this resistance... Uh, is one that again comes from a certain segment of society that maybe some of you have gotten tired of me talking about but this segment of society has a, or martial arts society the martial arts community has usurped it and has given the impression that their opinion is the only opinion that matters so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am uh, and that will tell you how I'm qualified to talk about mixed martial arts Okay, so very quickly, I started boxing when I was nine years old. I'm in my late 50s now. I've been boxing for about 50 years, okay, and teaching boxing for 50 years. Uh, when I was 12, I started in judo, okay? Uh, so this is like 1973, okay, that long ago. Uh, by 1976, I had a brown belt in judo was getting ready to test for my black belt, uh, but the school had closed down because there weren't enough uh, students. It wasn't popular at that time. Uh, it was in the hood or close to the hood, so most of the students would be black or Hispanic, and not enough of them were um, uh, interested in judo, so it closed down. So, in 1973, I start in judo. 1976, I have my brown belt in judo. At that point, I am uh, starting to, I'm 15, I'm starting to blend judo uh, with my boxing uh, in street fights. So I start to cross train. I'm starting to uh, work on choking people out uh, who have jerseys, uh, choking people out who have coats, uh, using the 12 points of off balancing uh, in street fights. I enter high school and then at 15, I start wrestling. So, this is like 1976, and I'm mixing wrestling, judo, both uh, gi, with, and I'm using it for clothes, uh, and no gi, and boxing, and this has happened in 1976, almost 20 years before the UFC. I enter into karate around that same time. Now I'm using front kicks, roundhouse kicks, uh, in uh, in my cross training and on occasion I will have a street situation I am using those too. Um, throughout my life I then get into Kyokushin Karate I get into Kyokushin Karate in 1980 um, around about 19 I stay there till around 1993 1991 uh, some kickboxers start coming over from Thailand to train with us in karate and they're getting ready for what became uh, the K-1 organization so I then start training uh, in uh, Muay Thai around 1991 uh, because of my Kyokushin training I already know how to kick to the leg so I'm not interested in that so what I do is after the class is over after we exchange techniques I started training exclusively with one of the fighters who came over from Thailand to train with us in Kyokushin Karate uh, for get ready for UK uh, K1 events I started training in only the clinch so I've been cross training uh, doing MMA uh, since about 1977 
uh, in my hometown, there were about three of us who were known to box, being to train in karate, and to wrestle. Uh, and I was one of those three in my hometown. Right? Again, this is like 20 years before the UFC. So by the time the UFC comes about in 1993, I am 32 years old. Uh, I've blown both knees out wrestling. I've torn my rotator cuff several times from, uh, from boxing. Uh, several other injuries from uh, kickboxing, from Kyokushin, and from judo. So I see a UFC and I say, it's about time. So that's what my background is in. Uh, I lastly want to say that when I started cross training, people like John Danaher was not even in. It was at least 10 years, uh, close to 15 years actually, before even John Danaher got involved into uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. At the time I was cross training, very few people were doing it. Uh, especially very few people were doing it locally. Most of the people who were doing cross training at the time that I was doing it uh, were people who had trained with Bruce Lee or some people like that. But for the most part, people were not cross training at the time that me and a small group of people in my neighborhood started mixing wrestling, judo, karate, and boxing together to see what we came up with. Okay, so those are my qualifications to talk about what I'm talking about now, which is, uh, which is the top 10 list of the greatest MMA fighters who ever lived. I'm going to, uh, again, this is going to be very uh, logical and it's going to be very philosophical. And uh, if you don't agree with me, then it's because you're wrong. So here we go. Let me tell you about the criteria. Uh, if it looks like I take this very seriously, I do because I'm tired of seeing these kind of these lists that people have and the lists are absolutely horrendous. The first criteria I want to say that does not matter as much is the undefeated record. Um, saying that a fighter is the best because he's undefeated uh, is rudimentary. Uh, it is not a logical it is really not a logical reason to say someone is the best. It is a default way of thinking. Okay, just like evolution. If you look at evolution, I believe in evolution, microevolution, macroevolution, not so much, but certainly microevolution changes um, within species. It's a fact. We see it every day. Right? If not every day, we've seen it in our lifetime. Uh, I do have an issue with, however, and it's not about evolution, but the issue that I do have with uh, uh, radical evolutionists is that one species gives rise to another complete species. Okay? because of the looks of things. I don't necessarily believe in that. But evolution is obvious. Anyone who disagrees with, disagrees with that, whether they're theist or atheist or whatever, uh, is wrong and is an error. But one of the things that evolution has going for itself is a default way of thinking. This default way of thinking goes like this. If I was to say to you, and I'm going to get this about the martial arts, but I want to explain this to you so you understand why I'm dismissing an undefeated record. Okay? So, if someone was to say, okay, if I was to tell you that we come from primates, all right, and I told you that that, uh, that system uh, had basically three motivations, um, uh, of, of, of one, to, um, to survive, two, to procreate, and three, uh, to, uh, to uh, ward off uh, natural predators. If I was to tell you that that system from ape to a human being uh, took place over a period of two weeks, you would not believe me. But if I told you that same system, for the same reasons, took place over a period of millions of years, you would believe me. And the reason is because of the default way of thinking we have. That default way of thinking that all human beings have, we have it naturally, it's innate, it comes to us, right, naturally, it comes to us honestly, and everyone has it, whether they fight it later on or not, but consciously or unconsciously, all human beings believe this, that given enough time, anything can happen. Given enough time, anything can happen. This is why we would not believe we come from apes over a two-week process, but we tend to believe we come from apes over a process that took millions of years. The same thing applies to someone being undefeated and therefore being the best. It is a rudimentary way of thinking. It is a default way of thinking. It is a very primitive and childish way of thinking. And why do I say it's childish? Because if you were to ask an, uh, an adolescent or a young, very young person who lacks the skills of really accurate reasoning or conscious reasoning and you ask well why don't you think that person can be beaten they would say if you ask them why do you think that person is the greatest of all time they would say because they've never lost 
you know, I don't think they can lose. Well, why don't you think they can lose? Well, because they've never lost. That is a rudimentary way of looking at things. So to say that someone is undefeated and therefore, because they're undefeated, they're the greatest of all time, uh, is not the is not a logical reason to conclude that they therefore are the greatest of all time. Period. Because they haven't lost. Okay. It's only a small part of the uh, the big picture. So now let's let's begin to look at the greatest martial mixed martial arts of all time. Now the criteria, the major criteria of this should be, and just so you know, I'm I have my books in the background. I'm just this off the comes off the top of my head. The only reason why I don't turn this around and show you that I'm not looking at anything, I haven't written anything down, except my notes for the top ten. Uh, so I remember them and it just goes smoothly. The only reason why I don't turn this camera around because I may not be able to get it focused again. I don't want to belabor this any longer than it has to be. So now let's look at what is the criteria for saying the greatest, we're talking about the greatest mixed martial arts of all time from a logical viewpoint. Well, we have to look at the term mixed. And that's the criteria we're going to use, mixed. So what does mixed mean? Um, who was best at mixing the different martial arts? So when we talk about mixing, what are we talking about? Seams. Seamless. Whose uh, game, whose mixed martial arts game was seamless? And by seamless, what I mean is the transitioning from punching to clinching to takedowns to position to submission, if that's what they want, okay, or ground and pound. Who was the smoothest, made the smoothest transitions when they were fighting from one range uh, to the other range, okay? Who mixed the smoothest blend of martial arts, right? Whose mix was the smoothest. So when you look, you're looking at this beautiful blend, this beautiful rainbow of different martial arts, different tactics, and it all comes together to look seamless, okay? In a smooth transition, okay? Who was capable of doing that the most? Well, and who was better at it? Okay. Well, we have to look at a person um, that had a great jab, great takedowns, great kicks. That is part of being seamless. Not only going from one position to the next, transitioning from one position to the next, from punching to grappling or to clinching to takedowns to, to, uh, to, to, to position to submission. But who blended these techniques? Whose hands were world class? Whose takedowns wrestling was world class? Um, whose kicks were world class, right? And who used those techniques and to make their attack and their defense seamless, smoothest, the smoothest? Well, you have prototypes. Now, the prototype, the first prototype mixed martial artist, and you will have to see his fight with Tito Ortiz, was Frank Shamrock. Okay, not Ken, but Frank Shamrock. Frank Shamrock was the prototype mixed martial artist. He was the first person for me who was a complete mixed martial artist. Not someone who did them all together, but the person who fought, who was most seamless, who was most smooth in his transitions. Great hands, great takedowns, great submissions, great transitions on the ground, great kicks. Okay, that was Frank Shamrock. Most people don't know that his first MMA fight was with a man by the name of Boss Rutin, who was a, a great fighter. Okay? But Frank Shamrock was the first prototype. But I'm not going to make him number one. The number one greatest MMA fighter, if we are talking about smoothness, transitions from one position to the next, world-class hands, world-class grappling, world-class kicks, and seamless transitions, a smooth transition from punching range to takedown, from the punching to the takedown, to the submission, to the position, has to be George St. Pierre. George St. Pierre is the greatest MMA fighter of all time. Okay, why? Because his transitions from one position to the next were without a choppy technique. He did not, he was not choppy. He would not be outside, throw a wild punch, then go for a takedown. Okay? He would not be outside, throw a kick, go for a takedown, realize, you know, not realize that he was too far out to go for a kick from a kick, to go for a takedown from kicking range and uh, get stuck underneath of someone's sprawl. Uh, his transition from one position uh, in relation to the opponent to the next was just breathtaking. 
George St. Pierre for the smoothest, smoothest MMA style, the smoothest MMA mix of a, of a technique and styles goes to George St. Pierre. Now, the other nine you may disagree with, but the problem is, is that you are not understanding what mixed martial arts is, okay, and what mixed martial arts is supposed to be. Okay, so here are the top 10 greatest mixed martial artists of all time, criteria being the perfect blend of technique, punch, kick, and grappling, and clinching, takedowns, all the techniques firmly put together or beautifully put together, smoothly put together to the point where when you watch them fight, there is a seamless Seamless motion or seamless transition from each range, punching range to clinch range, clinch range to takedown range, takedown range to uh, to position, uh, position to submission attempt or, or 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 escape or ground and pound. Okay. You will also find in my criteria the lost the lost art of double sh or of reshooting. Okay, going for a shot, the individual uh, gets ready to sprawl, or the individual moves back, or the individual throws a punch, or individual tests, uh, uh, tries a knee. You back out, you throw something else, and then you shoot again. Very few people uh, were good at reshooting. All right, if this is lost art, uh, and it's something that has to be trained. Very few people know how to reshoot. Okay. So number one, George St. Pierre, greatest MMA fighter of all time for the criteria that I gave you. Okay, number one. Okay, so I'm going to name the other nine. Number two is none other than Demetrius Johnson. Demetrius Johnson, okay, is number two for the same reasons. I have my list here that I wrote down not even five minutes ago to make sure this runs smoothly. Demetrius Johnson, for the same reasons that George St. Pierre is number one. Demetrius Johnson, yes, I know he was recently uh, stopped and won. Absolutely. Uh, but losing a fight doesn't mean that you're not one of the greatest of all time. Okay? Demetrius Johnson, smooth transition from each particular range. Uh, anytime you go for a suplex and in the air, you realize that you have an arm bar available, possibly for arm bar, and you grab the arm and then come down for an arm bar. I mean, you have to be in the top 10. So number two is Demetrius Johnson. Number three is the protocol, Frank Shamrock. Okay? Well, not the protocol, but the prototype, Frank Shamrock. Watch his fight with Tito Ortiz. If you want to see what a bottom game looks like, an active guard looks like, it doesn't come from BJJ. It comes from Frank Shamrock, okay, a submission fighter. So Frank Shamrock is number three. Number four is Boss Rutin. Number four, in my opinion, Boss Rutin is the greatest heavyweight of all time, not uh, Steve Miocic. I like Steve Miocic. He's not the greatest uh, heavyweight of all time as far as I'm concerned. Boss Rutin is number four. Number five is John Jones. I don't have John Jones higher because John Jones uh, has had the advantage in height for a lot of his fights, and height does matter. Height and weight does matter. Uh, to try to get in on John Jones is very difficult. Uh, John Jones can do a lot of things to you because of his height that you can't do to him. Uh, do to him. Do to him. Excuse me. Uh, why? Because he has the length. Okay. So John Jones is number five. Uh, Anderson Silver is six. Now. Some people might say, well, why Anderson Silver uh, when you're talking about takedowns? Well, because he had people did try to take him down. Uh, most people were not very successful, other than like we saw Charles Sonnen. Uh, but Anderson Silva's um, defense, a uh, takedown defense, has to be uh, something that's taken very seriously. So even though he did not take a lot of people down, even though we don't see really how good he was from the ground, Anderson Silva's uh, seamlessness, uh, his, his ability to throw punches and still have the frame of mind to defend against takedowns when people are desperate enough to shoot, um, hands down, Anderson Silva has to be in there, even though he didn't do a lot of groundwork. So Anderson Silva is number six. Number seven is Fedor Emelianenko. Fedor Emelianenko has to go there, not just because of his stellar record against other heavyweights, but because of he, his ability to throw, to punch good enough 
the punch good. It wasn't a great boxer, but the punch good enough to get in uh, to his vaunted clinching, uh, his clinching, and do his famous, uh, uh, his famous throws. All right, without giving up his back most of the time, and without going to the ground with his opponent. Number eight is Daniel Cormier. Daniel Cormier had a great ability to transition, uh, being short, very short for heavyweight, the great ability to transition from punching into clinch. He had one of the dirtiest, the best dirty clinches, um, uh, uh, one of the most devastating clinch games I've ever seen. So his transitioning was very good for somebody uh, 5'10". Uh, number nine is Khabib Namanamagdov. I know I butchered that name. That's why I always say Khabib. All right, Khabib is number nine. Now there are some people who say Khabib belongs at at uh, at number one or two or three. Again, not because he's undefeated does not mean that I think that he is the best. Um, he was not didn't have the smoothest transition. There were times he would go for the takedown, and sometimes would look relatively sloppy. Now it happens; those things happen, uh, especially when your 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 striking game may not be up to par, or may not be good enough for it to be taken extremely seriously. You tend to get desperate and go for the takedown. Uh, he became smoother over time, uh, going for the takedown, uh, but. Um, he was not always, he didn't have that smooth transition that we see with Demetrius Johnson and we see with George St. Pierre. And number 10, I have to put in Henry Cejudo. I have to put in Henry Cejudo. Henry Cejudo uh, goes in there at 10 to round out 10. After a few fights, Kamaru Usman is going to knock Henry, Henry Cejudo out. And Kamaru Usman is going to, because of his... His smoothness uh, doesn't have the hands of George St. Pierre. He has a great jab, uh, but he does do a lot of things good, and he is starting to become even smoother in his, in his transition from punch range to clinch range to takedowns to submissions to ground and pound. All right? So the top 10 greatest MMA fighters of all time, and we are talking about mixed, mixed, the smoothest MMA fighters of all time. And I recommend that you watch all of these fighters. Watch every one of them so you know exactly what I am talking about. Again, I am not talking about record necessarily. I am not even talking, they happen to have a good record, but I am not talking about records not necessarily. I'm certainly not talking about being undefeated necessarily. I am talking about the greatest mixed martial artists. When you look at them and you see a very smooth, seamless blend between every element that goes into mixed martial arts, punching, kicking, grappling, clinching, throwing, positioning, okay? When you look at all getting up uh, uh, from the ground, escapes, transitions from one position to the next, that seamless way of fighting that is so well-tuned, well-tuned, well-toned, the finished mixed martial arts, when you look at them and you say they shine, there is a sheen to their game. Number one, George St. Pierre. Number two, Demetrius Johnson. Number three, Frank Shamrock. Number four, Boss Rutin. Number five, John Jones. Number six, Anderson Silva. Number seven, Fedor Emelianco. Number eight, Daniel Cormier. Number nine, Khabib. Number ten, Henry Cejudo with Kamal Usman coming up and eventually going to push Henry Cejudo out. If he wins two more fights, and Cejudo will go to 11. Okay, uh, that is the criteria, and that is the ultimate list of the greatest mixed martial artists who ever, ever, ever lived. If any of you people really want to learn about mixed martial arts, all right, you really want to learn about it, watch any 10, right? Watch any 10, watch any two or three of these particular fighters according to your weight okay according to your weight according to your body build you don't want to watch John Jones if you're about you don't want to study John Jones too much if you're about four inches uh, shorter than the the person of uh, uh, the average person in your division okay but certainly those top 10 let me say it one more time I'm so proud of this list because it's just so damn logical number one George St. Pierre number two Demetrius Johnson number three Frank Shamrock number four Boss Rutin Number five, John Jones. Number six, Anderson Silva. Number seven, Fedor Emelianenko. Number eight, Daniel Cormier. Number nine, Khabib. Number ten, Henry Cejudo with Kamaru Usman creeping up. Two more fights. Kamaru Usman takes ten. Henry Cejudo moves to eleven.
Okay? My name is Safe Carmen. This is the Uma Fight Camp, and this is the only list of mixed martial arts, the greatest mixed martial arts that ever lived, the only criteria and list that matters on social media. I'll see you next video.